All right. Well, once again, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's great, great to see you here. It's really, we really appreciate it. I know you have a lot of things to do and uh, places to be, especially on a beautiful summer evening. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, so uh, we are going to, here's how we're going to proceed. We've received some questions. And so we're going to just chat a bit and go through some of those. And we also invite you to put questions in the chat if you have some that are uh, that are on your mind. And so we'll get through as many as we can here. And Liz and I are really happy to have you here with us today. Um, and so um, I think that's all I need to say as kind of a preliminary. Uh, Representative Bolden, do you want to say hello? Yes. Hello, everybody, and welcome. And I will just echo the thank you for being here um, on this lovely Minnesota August uh, weeknight evening. There's lots of things you could be doing with your time. Um, and we just really appreciate you being here with us to, um, uh, you know, hear about, um, we're happy to answer questions about, you know, the session and kind of where things are at and how things went. And so i um, grateful to be here with you. Um, and perhaps I'll uh, give a little kind of introduction and, and give uh, my few kind of opening thoughts, and then I will pass it back to um, Rep. Liebling to do the same. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Liz Bolden. I represent District 25B, which is Northern Rochester. I am um, in my first term, just got elected last November, um, and so have made it through my first session. So, um, and it was quite the session. Uh, learned lots, and it was um you know, a different session than anybody had ever had before with COVID. We were um, primarily virtual, pretty much nearly all virtual um, and lots and lots of issues and lots and lots of work to do. So I just am so grateful and honored to be able to represent our community. Um, and uh, just, I'm, I'm so thankful for the trust that has been placed in me to do that work. And it's really meaningful to me to hear from all of you. And so I'm grateful uh, tonight to be here to do that. And I'll say this again at the end, but um, just really welcome conversations with um, all of you. If, if there are issues that you want to hear about or questions that you have, um, I really, really value having those conversations. So please reach out to me um, anytime. I would love to have those conversations with you. So. Um, as I look back over the, the last session, my first session here, um, just as background, the committees that I serve on are the um, Health, Finance and Policy with Chair Liebling, uh, Human Services, Finance and Policy, Early Childhood, and Local Government Division. So that's sort of the sphere, the work that I um, have been in and been doing. I will say um, the the piece of work or the space that I have been um, perhaps the most excited about is in the early childhood committee. I really have grown to love that committee and that work. Um, honestly, more than I expected that I would. I really, because my of my background in healthcare, I'm a nurse, I really expected um, to spend most of my time in health, um, but really fell in love with the um, early childhood space and, and did um, really uh, enjoy my work there because it's, it's so important if, you know, and if we are going to invest dollars, in my mind, the smartest place is to invest those dollars in those early childhood years because it pays dividends for generations to come. And so really proud of the work that we um, were able to accomplish there, um, as well as uh, other work over the course of the, of the session that we will get into a little bit more and talk more about. Um, but uh, perhaps I'll, I'll leave it there and, and pass it back to Representative Liebling. Okay, well, thanks so much, uh, Representative Bolden. So, well, um, this is not my first term in the legislature. I think all of you know that. And, but boy, it's the first one that was anything like this one. As you all know, we, we were, did everything virtually after, well, after March of 2020, when we kind of shut everything down for COVID, it's, it's been like one long legislative session. So Liz wasn't even in a sense, she wasn't even there at the beginning of this long legislative session. It's been quite the march through all of it for about 18 months with COVID, because um, COVID impacted everything. So we've we've worked virtually. We had this last uh, budget session, the, the 
as most of you know, the legislature works in two year cycles. The first year of the cycle is considered the budget year. So we have to pass a budget by the end of the year or else the government shuts down. So that's our main work. And then the second year is the policy year and also capital investment. So we'll be going into that now starting in February. So we had quite the year trying to do the budget. As you may have heard, we started out with a big budget deficit projected. And then uh, things got a lot better, especially with the federal investment. It was very, very helpful and helped our whole economy. And we then came out with a surplus. And then there, by the end, there was also a lot of federal resources from the American Rescue Plan that came into our budget as well. So it's been a really unusual year in a lot of ways. Um, so just, um, I don't wanna take all the time here just talking, we wanna get to your questions, but as you know, I, um, or maybe you don't know, I, I chair now the, uh, the new Health Finance and Policy Committee. We, we range things a bit differently this year. I also sit on the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee with Representative Bolden and, and um, I also sit on the um, Judiciary and Civil Law Committee and on Ways and Means, which is kind of the big finance committee. So a lot of work going on there. Um, but the, the wonderful thing about being in the legislature is that it's really a team activity. And when you have a wonderful team, it is such a pleasure, as hard as you may work. And I know you all know this in your lives too, an awful lot depends on who's doing the work with you. And Representative Bolden's been just a tremendous colleague so far. I'm so thrilled to have her. And the rest of our team is a very, very strong team. So we had a very successful year in this terrible time of COVID with so much pain and so much struggle. Minnesota really, I feel like it was a very good session that we came out really strong. It was very hard to get there but a lot of good things were done. Not, and of course, there's always a lot of work left to do, but a, a really successful session. So with that, I think we could maybe turn to some of the questions. Hi hey there. Uh, so the first question uh, comes from our chat here, and we'd of course invite folks uh, either on Zoom or on Facebook Live to drop their questions in. Uh, what happened to the education funding? So um, education, of course, is one of the most important things we do in the legislature. Um, the, the, uh, it's right in our constitution that education is one of our prime responsibilities. And I'm pleased to say that at the end of the day, we came out very strong in education. Um, we had, were able to do the largest increase in education funding in about 15 years. Now, the, I, I gather that the way that timing works, it's not enough to keep all the districts from having to do layoffs and so on because of you know when the money flow happens. But we're pretty pleased with this outcome. There was also other money allocated for summer programs, which is so important because our kids have really had a struggle. And we know that online learning and especially kind of the quick move to online learning and uncertainty and isolation from their friends and so on was really detrimental to a lot of our kids. So there is a lot of concern and the legislature certainly hears about it and tries to respond to it. And um, so I think that's probably one of the reasons we were able to come in with a pretty sizable um, increase in funding. So for those of you who like the numbers, the increase is um, 2.45% in the first year and then 2% in the second year. So 4.45 over the two years. Um, and it's good because the uh, when the Senate came in with their bill, their bill had a zero increase. So we we did well and, and uh, came in with some good things. There are some, we stopped some bad stuff from happening in the education area. There was a, a lot of attempts to um, have school vouchers and drain money out of the public school system. And we were able to hold that off. And there are some um, special investments as well, for example, to build up our workforce, the diversity of our teacher workforce. So um, some investment into teachers of color, which is a really important need because um, 
we are not, um, you know, we have many more students of color in our schools than we do teachers of color. And many of us believe that it's really important for children to have role models that look like them. So um, this is something we we are proud of and the work continues. So thanks for that question. Right, our next question here uh, came in ahead of time. What is the state doing to get the Delta variant under control and stop a new COVID wave? Well, I'm so lucky that I have Liz Bolden, who's a nurse, to help me with these questions. And uh, I'll start out, and I think she'll probably want to have a few things to say, too. So, you know, we're in this really interesting situation. The governor was exercising emergency powers until very recently. And we in Minnesota have done very well compared to a lot of the country. And I think that the governor deserves a great deal of credit for that, for putting some controls in place to keep people safe. But now, of course, we have a vaccine. And the best thing that we can all do to be safe from COVID is to get vaccinated and to try to get everybody vaccinated as much as we can. So um, what the state is doing right now is there's an incentive program. They're offering an incentive of $100 if people get vaccinated between now and I think maybe October in an effort to really finish up and close the gap because that is what we need to do. Um, and some of us are thinking about legislation, ways that we can push this forward more. I don't think, though, that you'll see mandates coming from the state on either masks or vaccines too much. I think, um, you know, uh, I think that you will see some coming from individual employers and uh, from different sectors and it, employers can require vaccines, by the way, they can do that under the law. Um, but I think that it's, um, it's going to be difficult with the Senate uh, to come to agreement on mandates. And that's kind of the real challenge that we have. Liz, do you want to jump in and help yeah, me out I, here? I would agree with all of that. I And I think my biggest message with this is the the most important thing is for as many people who can to get vaccinated. That is the path. That is how we keep folks safe. Um, and so uh, Rep. Liebling, uh, Liebling spoke about, you know, what can the state do? I uh, think about you know what can we individually do, and especially as elected leaders or you know community leaders, what you know I think about what is my part in that, and what can I do? And in my mind, I think a lot about um, just providing accurate information. You know, disinformation right now is a, a, a huge threat. It's a huge problem, and it's dangerous, and it um, you know it, it puts people's lives at risk. And so I think it's just so important to be sure that you know people have are looking at accurate reliable information um because there's so much disinformation and misinformation out there so um that is what i'm thinking about and what i'm trying to do and just um you know trying to keep that message out that the vaccine is safe um it is it has been tested and researched and it is the best thing that we all can do because we are still all we are still in this i mean covid is not behind us we are very much in it and we are you know we're seeing an uptick again right now um and it, to me right now it's even more frustrating because it doesn't have to be this way we have a vaccine that is safe and effective and um works and that's that's how we get past this and through this together. And people are getting sick and dying who don't need to. It, does, it doesn't have to be that way. So um, if you, you know, for folks, I have lots of conversations. If, if folks are still not vaccinated and still have questions and concerns, um, that's okay. But please reach out to people, you know, healthcare experts, your healthcare provider, um, not, you know, your uncle from Facebook, who's, you know, got information that may not be accurate. So, um, you know, get, like, get that reliable information, get your questions answered, uh, and please get vaccinated if you have not already. So Liz, that really makes me think just today, I was communicating with somebody over email, who uh, 
believes the following, and I want to put this to you because you're a nurse, right? This person told me, and I had never heard this before. She told me that uh, people who are newly vaccinated can shed the virus when they're newly vaccinated. Can you address that one? There's a piece of misinformation, yeah, right? So that's one. it is, absolutely. Um, and that's a piece that I have not heard before either. So that is not true. Um, you know, some back in the sphere of vaccines that we have, some vaccines are like a weakened um, version of the illness, right? That isn't the case for the COVID-19 vaccine. So it is not possible for someone who has gotten the COVID-19 vaccine um, to, from that vaccine, shed the virus because they don't have the virus within them. It just isn't how it works. It's not possible. Yeah. Thank you. That's just an example. Sounds reasonable to somebody who read it on the internet and just yeah. plain old isn't true. Yeah, not accurate. Thank you. All right, next question here. How is Minnesota done with the federal dollars that were earmarked for rental relief to prevent evictions? I understand there were up to 29 states that have not yet released those funds. So I can speak to this. Um, so this is a, another case where Minnesota has done better than other states. Um, I, I think it is true that there are other states who have yet to release those funds. Um, so in Minnesota, we uh, passed in the legislature uh, what we have called an off-ramp uh, to the eviction moratorium. And so puts in place, it actually has four tiers um, between now and 105 days after the law was enacted, where it sort of steps down um, the, the possibility of folks getting evicted. And, you know, that eviction moratorium was put into place, you know, during a global pandemic, it's not safe to be having people, you know, evicted from their, their homes. And, you know, when we're telling people that you need to stay home and stay safe for people to not have a home. So that it, it was put in place for a, a very good reason to keep people safe. Um, and it also is necessary, was necessary to sort of have a stepwise approach to not just have a cliff where people now were having, you know, tens of thousands of people being evicted uh, from their homes. So we did put into place um, sort of that stepwise approach and there is, um, those dollars are available. So for um, renters who are behind on rent, which we know, you know, the last year and a half has been really, really difficult for many, many people who may be out of work or have lost work. Um, you know, paying the rent may have been very difficult or impossible during those times. There's lots of valid reasons why people may be behind on their rent. If that is the case for you, there is help available um, to apply for those funds. And that helps those, those funds then go directly to the landlords. Um, so it helps both the landlords and the tenants. Um, so those, those funds are in place and uh, we, are, we are in a better place here in Minnesota than, than other states are who have not done that work. I will also yeah. say, oh, sorry, just, I just would also add, and then I'll, I'll pass it over, that we also passed, um, I want to say it's $20 million um, that went to counties across the state to help with preventing homelessness. So there, there's dollars there, too, that work is happening that, you know, everyone should have a safe place to call home and a safe place to lay their head at night, always, and especially in a global pandemic. And so making those investments is really, really important. Right. Thanks for that, Liz. And I think it's really important to, to tell people to get the message out that the money's available and they need to apply. And there, there have been some delays in getting the money out, but it's really important for people to apply and um, because it is there. And uh, besides staying safe from COVID, I mean, if, if a lot of people get evicted from their homes all at once, this could be tremendously disruptive and eviction is just awful anyway. So everyone who can take advantage of this, we really encourage you to do so. And, you know, if you're if you are somebody who owns property and has tenants and they're behind in their rent, you know, please let them know about this. This is supposed to really help everyone. So and I'll just chime in. I had to look it up to be sure I was getting it right. That application to to apply for that, those funds, um, people should go to renthelpmn.org. 
Yep. Right, uh, move on to our next question. Other states are taking swift action to restrict access to the ballot box. What steps can Minnesota take to protect democracy? So I would love to jump into this one. Um, I actually just came back last night from DC where I was with my colleague and good friend, Representative Emma Greenman, who her background is as a voting rights lawyer. This is the work she's done for her entire career. And we were there with a group of nearly 150 other state legislators um, advocating for that the Senate passed the For the People Act uh, before they um, recess. And so that's what sh should be done, in my view, at the federal level. Um, and then as we look at, you know, at, at the state level, the, um, the person who submitted that question is exactly right. There is a coordinated effort across many states to put up barriers for people to be able to vote. Um, and that is wrong. Um, there, we have done some work um, here in Minnesota. Uh, Rep. Emma Greenman was the, an author to House File 9, which was a bill that um, uh, uh, mirrors a little bit that, that federal level bill. It, it um, increased, um, it, it made voting essentially easier for people as you know, everyone has the right to vote. It should be easy for people to make their vote or make their voice heard and to, to, to cast their vote. We you know, believe that everybody's voice is important and they, they should be able to have that vote, whether they vote for Democrats or Republicans, um, they should be able to cast that ballot. And so, you know, things like uh, automatic voter registration and, um, you know, we have in Minnesota same day voter registration. And uh, we know because of the, the last election in a pandemic, we many folks utilized mail-in ballots or voting from home uh, more so than they have in the past. And so there are a lot of things that we can do to uh, make voting easier for people to be sure that everybody can make their, their voices heard. That freedom to vote is really, really important. Um, and it's really important that we are protecting our democracy in a time when it's at risk, quite frankly. There are, there are um, efforts to, to limit um, certain people um, in, in many cases uh, from, from voting. So um, with that, I will just put in a plug uh, that uh, Representative Liebling and I are um, working on um, planning a future town hall uh, opportunity uh, in coordination with Representative Emma Greenman on this very topic, just sort of a democracy forum, if you will. Um, so stay tuned for um, more details on that because it's, it's an important topic and there's a lot happening in that space. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I find the most troubling in the news from other states is that some legislatures are actually passing laws that give the legislatures the power to undermine the will of the voters. And to me, that's really the most frightening thing, because if, you know, it's not only um, that everybody should be able, everyone who's eligible should be able to cast their ballot without any hindrance, and they should be, you know, encouraged to do so and participate in our democracy, but once those ballots are cast, we have to make sure they're fairly counted and that the people who count them are, are um, you know, doing it, that they're not partisans, that they're, uh, there are appropriate controls in place so that people can be assured that, that they're being counted appropriately and that the decision makers are the voters. And so what some of these legislatures are doing is giving themselves the power to declare an election differently than the way the voters declared it. And that is, I think, a very frightening thing. But in Minnesota, because um, we have divided government here, we, um, that is not happening here in Minnesota, thank goodness. But I think we all do need to be concerned when we see this, what I, what I would consider a real power grab by legislators. I mean, I, you know, you all elect us to vote on certain matters, but you don't elect us to elect the president of the United States or to elect your, your U.S. senators or Congress people. You cast those ballots, and our job is to make sure that those are, you know, that you can cast those ballots and that those ballots are counted and reported out fairly. Go to another question here uh, related to elections. What are you doing to enact ranked choice voting? 
So I will start with that one. So I think just in terms of ranked choice voting, there was a, a bill um, in this last session um, and I was a co-author of that bill. Um, it didn't uh, make it past the finish line. Um, so, you know, in terms of what I am doing now uh, is largely just having conversations with people to, um, you know, I'm an advocate. I, I believe in ranked choice voting. I believe it's a, um, it strengthens our democracy. I believe it is a way that, you know, to elect people who have the, the most you know, broad support. It, it allows uh, more diversity of candidates and more diversity in the process. Um, so at this point, I'm just having conversations with people to, who have questions to kind of explore, share why I'm in support of it and maybe answer questions if people aren't sure about it or have, or, you know, have not sure how it works or have questions about it. Um, so that's what I'm doing at this point. I'll continue to be an advocate. And, you know, I think it's one of those things where when people understand it and get a little more information about it, they often you know, come into more support of it. It's like, well, you know, I'm not sure. I don't know if I support that. But once they once they understand it and have more information about it, they off, oftentimes I hear, oh yeah, that makes sense. I, you know, that does make sense to me. I would support that. So um, I will continue to have conversations with folks about it and be an advocate where I can. All right, and then dovetailing off of that question, uh, how do you feel about Fair Vote Minnesota's recent union busting ac accusations? Um, I will say I support every worker's right to organize. Um, I know there's uh, been some activity with that, and I, I have concerns um, because I, I believe workers should, you know, do have the right to organize and should be able to do that. I, my understanding of that situation is that um, there's further conversations happening and the the workers have made some you know a list of demands and and fair votes now is looking at those and is going to provide a response and so um i'm that's my understanding of where things are at and i'll you know what's um i'm interested is uh you know hearing how the the staff how the workers feel about you know the response from fair votes and what we'll kind of go from there but i am strong supporter and believer in unions and, and they should have the right to do that. Yeah, I don't know if everybody has even heard about this or, you know, and it, it might be, I see some heads shaking. Yeah, so um, it's, you know, it's not, um, you know, Fair Vote Minnesota is a nonprofit. And from what I understand, again, kind of from a distance is that their employees uh, wanted to unionize and there's been some conflict about what happened when they asked to unionize and so on. And I'm with Liz, I just, you know, I try not to get involved in this directly. I don't know that that's really, uh, that I can be helpful in that space, but, you know, of course, I think that every employee should have the right to seek to join a union. And, um, you know, usually in progressive organizations, we hold them to a pretty high standard when it comes to these sorts of things. All right. And then bouncing back to the uh, topic of uh, renter assistance, uh, we had talked about the eviction moratorium uh, ending earlier. Uh, question here in the chat, renthelpmn.org lists partners as Anoka, Dakota, Hennepin, Ramsey, St. Paul, and Washington counties. Is it open to all counties in Minnesota? This is a statewide initiative, correct? Correct. Yeah, I don't know why it would say that because absolutely it's available across the state. Mm -hmm. right, we'll yeah, and, and as always, and before you move on, DJ, just let me just say, if anybody tries to make contact with them and has any difficulty, please reach out to one of us and we can we can help if there's if there's ever a concern about getting through or, you know, a confusion when you actually go to try to use the state program. Right. The pandemic has been hard on people with disabilities. What did the legislature do to help them? So, wow, this is the greatest year for people with disabilities, pretty much that I've seen in my years in the legislature. And a big reason for that is the federal assistance. Um, there's been a great deal of federal money coming into Minnesota for home and community based services. And so this is federal money that um, 
we are somewhat uh, constrained in how we spend it. But we spent a great deal of time um, figuring out how to allocate the money. And it can't, I don't know if the numbers mean anything to anyone on the call, but I think we spent around $700 million on uh, much of it on disability services. So there are things that are going to be happening like increase in wages for personal care attendants, which is a huge issue. And, uh, you know, these are folks who do incredibly important work and they are so underpaid, but we were able to, to um, put a great deal of resource into that. Um, also, um, people who deliver services in other settings will be seeing raises sooner um, than we had expected before. So, you know, those are just a couple of things. Um, we, there's uh, money going into um, the, something called the Elderly Waiver, which is a program for um, low-income seniors who need assistance. Um, and the state pays for part of that, and also the feds help with that. So. Um, it's it's really like too big of a question to even answer in a short period of time because the list is very, very long. And I, I think it's going to be just tremendous to see how some of these things roll out. And our goal as a, when we negotiated th this bill and the, the disability part of the bill, the goal is to help people be as independent as they want to be and to give them the assistance that they need to be independent, to live in the most independent settings and to be part of society. And people need different levels of support to do that. And it's difficult because we're in a workforce shortage right now. It's really hard to find people. So raising wages, we hope will help with that. It won't be a panacea. There have got to be other approaches as well, but it, it certainly being able to have someone who does that important work actually make a living doing it is a really important piece of the puzzle. So thanks for the question. Next question here. And uh, before I ask it, just want to remind folks to go ahead and drop questions in the chat, either on Facebook Live or in Zoom. We get just shy of an hour here left blocked off for this event. Uh, question, what will it take to pass common sense gun violence prevention legislation like background checks and red flag laws? That is an excellent question and one that is uh, close to my heart. This is an issue that I have done, um, you know, been working on for some time as a, a volunteer with Moms Demand Action. Um, I, you know, I have three kiddos that I want to keep safe and I want to keep all kids safe. I want to keep all of us safe. And so um, we know that gun violence is a real issue. And there, again, it, it doesn't have to be that way. There, we, there are things that we could do uh, to improve that. Um, things like red flag laws, uh, universal background checks. Um, and those are things that um, certainly I support. Um, the, the problem is there, there aren't enough people who do support them. But just, you know, to be honest, I, um, there are, you know, it needs to, things like that would need to pass both in the House and in the Senate. Um, currently, the, our House is, um, majority is the Democrats, and in the Senate, the majority is the Republicans. Uh, and so, you know, a bill like that would have to uh, pass in both bodies. Um, and right now, there are not the votes to do so. And so um, that the just the logistics of that mean either people need enough people need to change their minds and get behind those things and support them, or there needs to be different place, different uh, people in office to casting those votes. It has to be one of the two of those things. Um, so I will continue to advocate. Um, you know, everybody should be safe from gun violence. Um, and there are things that we could do to help with that. So I'll continue to advocate and would encourage everybody else to do the same. Yeah, this is an issue that somewhat seemed to um, fade into the background just a little bit because other things were so much in the forefront, but uh, it never really goes away. There's always, uh, we've just become used to a tremendous amount of gun violence. And I, you know, I share Liz's opinion. I think, you know, this is, 
one of those issues that until we change the policy makers, I don't think we're going to change the policy because, um, and, and these are policies, these are not extreme policies, of course, these are things that gun owners, many gun owners agree with. And uh, this is should be really the low hanging fruit. But because of the way our politics are divided right now, it makes it really hard, even, you know, even for modest improvements like these and um, other states have passed them and they should not be partisan issues but unfortunately they have become that so um, you know there's I, I think we just have to keep our eye on the ball and keep keep trying to make some change even if it's incremental change because boy is it important all right, next question here. Is there any type of vaccine mandate on the horizon at major public employers, including the state of Minnesota and the University of Minnesota? Well, I think that the only vaccine mandates we're going to see are, um, I think that the, the kinds of mandates in Minnesota for that Minnesota government employees could perhaps be required to do kind of, you know, because they are employees. So the government as a as an employer can probably do something. But I think, as we said before in this town hall, I don't think we're going to see a lot of mandates, um, not from uh, government. Now, I'm not sure what the University of Minnesota is doing, but they are independent. You know, this is something that um, people maybe don't always realize is because it's a land grant college, the legislature really is cannot say you must do X. What we can do is say, um, if you want us to give you this money you're asking for, it comes with strings, but the budget is already done. And I don't think there were any kind of strings like that. So we're not in a position to mandate to them. I do think that as people look at the situation and they realize how dire it is, and that the best way out of this is vaccines. And um, um, Mary put in the in the chat that the U has mandated masks in classes and buildings. That's great. They can do that. We can't make them do that. But they, of course, you know, using the science available, and there are some amazing people working for the university who understand how all of this works. So I'm sure they're listening to the experts and. Um, and doing the best they can to make help people be safe. And until we can get our arms around this and all pull in the same direction, it's going to be very hard to defeat this thing. And it is it is a scary situation. So, yeah. Liz, do you have any anything oh, to would, add in there? Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think it's exactly right what you just said of, you know, until we are all working together and moving together in the same direction, we're not going to beat that. I beat this. I think that's exactly true. This this is we all have to work together at this um, to get to get past it. And so, yeah, I think, again, all I'm going to say vaccination is the most important thing we all can do right now. Um, and because um, enough of us are not yet vaccinated, we are now in a place where we should be wearing masks again because that spread is still happening. And so, um, yeah, I think we just all need to work together. And you know, what I know about Minnesotans is that we care about each other and we take care of each other. And right now what that looks like is getting vaccinated and wearing a mask if you're in close proximity to other people. Um, I would just add that the question was about, um, you know, what the state can mandate, but in terms of, I sometimes get questions about what business, you know, private businesses can mandate, you know, is it, you know, is it okay or can a private business m mandate um, things for their staff? And the answer is yes, they can. They do that already right now for other things. And so we may see that. Um, whether it's, you know, whether they're using carrots or sticks um, is, you know, up to them, but. Ultimately, it is in everyone's best interest for people to get vaccinated and be safe. Now, I think one of the things we really see clearly in through this pandemic and and all of the, um, you know, what's going on is that a lot of what happens in society depends upon people, people's willingness to participate in it, right? 
people's willingness to to go along with a mandate, for example. So even if the um, even if the governor was to say, I'm going to mandate that everyone wear a mask, you know, it's really impossible to force everyone to do something if they don't want to do it. What's really important is that people, you know, we have this social compact where people have to care about each other. If they don't, society falls apart. I mean, at some level, we all have to agree to follow the rules just because they're the rules, right? At, at some level, uh, you know, we as Americans, we like to, we like to know, we want to know, we don't want people to tell us what to do. But, um, you know, that is our strength, but it's also it makes it very difficult for us to, um, in a situation like this, where we just need people to do the right thing, and everybody has to do it. And no police officer is going to follow everybody around to make sure that they wear their mask when they should. But we just got to depend on each other to do these things. Yeah. And I, I would also just add, I see a note in the chat about um, how much of this has turned into a partisan issue. And I just I think that's so unfortunate, because it it shouldn't be, you know, getting a vaccine or wearing a mask is not a partisan, it should not be a partisan issue. You know, the COVID-19 does not discriminate. Um, it, it will and can infect anyone. And so it, it isn't a partisan issue. It's about caring for our neighbors and, and wanting to keep people safe and healthy. And, you know, on that note, I've been very heartened to see that some Republican governors around the country are starting to really speak out on this and some other Republican elected officials and here in Minnesota, even, you know, uh, it's, I think the tide is starting to change a little bit on that. Not everybody, of course, but people need to see, I mean, it was after all, former president Trump really did start the ball rolling with the vaccines. So, you know, he should get the credit for, for doing that. And people should, realize that this is not a partisan issue. Everyone needs to get that vaccine. All right, our next question. The recent smoke covering much of the state has highlighted the need for climate action. Will you pressure Governor Walls to halt line three? So I will start with this one. I've been uh, fairly vocal about, um, I believe we should be stopping line three. Um, I think, you know, the beginning of that question is, you know, around our climate crisis, which is happening. We are in the middle of a climate crisis. I sometimes hear people talk about climate change, like some like nebulous thing that is like somewhere out there in the future. It is right now. We are in it. We are living it. Um, and it is going to continue to get worse. Um, so we need to take action now. We need to take bold action now. We need to take significant action now. Um, again, I think about my three kids and the, the world that you know they are gonna be living in. Um, we need to do things differently. We are not on a path that is um, you know, creating a world that we want our next generations to, to be living in. And so, um, so for that reason, um, you know, living in the climate crisis, as well as, uh, you know, with line three, there are real um, issues with um, treaty rights and the, the rights of our indigenous populations and, the, and um, those agreements that we have made and are um, not abiding by um, that I, I, you know, have been um, advocating uh, to do what we can to stop line three. I, I have been up just two weeks ago, I was up at um, the Shell River um, site to see, you know, um, kind of the area where line three is going through. It's beautiful up there. And um, though we are in a drought, so the river was quite shallow in many places, mm -hmm. um, did some kayaking and it's, it's just, it's really beautiful, but that beauty is at risk. And not only is it beautiful, it's um, it's where, again, those indi our indigenous populations, the indigenous populations, you know, grow wild rice and are hunting and fishing and, um, you know, that's their land. And there's a huge potential that it will be uh, impacted um, by, uh, you know, tar sands pipeline, uh, pipeline um, from a, you know, a Canadian multinational corporation. So I have 
real concerns about that. So what I'm, you know, from my standpoint, what I'm doing is just, you know, continuing to advocate. We have been um, asking some questions. There's also concerns about sort of the process, um, uh, some of the, the permits that have been um, approved um, and modifications to those permits. You know, the initial ask for um, from Enbridge um, for that pipeline, the initial ask for water was uh, 500 million gallons of water. They recently um, amended that request to have it be 5 billion gallons of water um, in a time that we are in a drought across the state. And so um, there, there's questions um, about that process and you know why are we doing some of these things and so um, I'll continue to, to ask those questions and kind of push the issue. Yeah, it just seems at this point in 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 the climate crisis when you know we look around and we see what's happening we've got drought we've got fires we've got floods we've got you know you can just see it happening before your eyes and and yet all of this money and all of this energy into this old technology when we need to do the exact opposite we move, instead of moving tar sand tar oil we need to move away from that we need to have resources put into things that are actually going to be moving us forward not into things that will further destroy the environment i mean it's just astoundingly you know it's just astounding to me that it has had that it has gone forward as it has and um you know i fully understand the jobs question and you know the investment and all of that but there there are a lot of needs and there are a lot of things that we could be doing and hopefully if the um, u.s congress gets us act together hopefully we will be doing where we can do a lot more and uh and create a lot of jobs and do things have people doing things that are moving us in the right direction instead of back to the 19th century. Yeah, I would agree. I completely agree with that. And I would say, you know, I am in favor of a just transition. Like we need to support people as we move from, you know, our kind of current state to that green economy, but we have to be moving to that green economy and those, those green energies. And that would create many, many jobs. There are jobs to be had in those sectors to, 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 to get us there. That's what we need to be investing in. All right, question here from the Zoom chat. With the Sturgis rally in the Black Hills being called a potential deadly mass spreader event, what are your thoughts for the future of this year's Minnesota State Fair? Oh my goodness, I probably am not able to predict any more than any of you, but I, I have to say I am mm -hmm. quite concerned, quite concerned. And I, I think I read that there's going to be a mandate to wear masks indoors. Honestly, I think if anybody wants to go and be in the crowd, and that's why people go to the fair after all, it's fun to be in the crowd, I'd say wear your mask in the crowd. I mean, that's, this is, I think there's a potential for real, real problems. And, um, you know, hopefully this is all changing very, very rapidly. It's hard to say what's going to happen even a week from now with this new Delta variant and how quickly things are moving. So I don't know, I per just personally am very concerned about it. And of course, it's very helpful if people are vaccinated. If I um, was in charge of the Minnesota State Fair, I'd probably say you got to be vaccinated to get in. I don't think that's going to happen, though. So, you know, we'll, we'll just have to see. Liz, do you want to look into your crystal ball? Yeah, my crystal ball is broken, uh, but <laughs> I, I concur. I agree with all of that. I, in terms of the Sturgis rally, I I'm very, very concerned about that. Be and what, what we saw last year is that it was a super spreader event. And, you know, people come from all over the country, you know, conglomerate there together, spread COVID all around, and then go back all over across the country and take it back. And I really, really worry that, I mean, that is what is going to happen again. Um, and so then, you know, it, turning to the state fair, I, I agree. I have significant concerns about that. Um, it is outdoors, which is 
better than being indoors, but just, you know, the types of crowds having that many people in that close of a space together, um, it, it concerns me. It makes me very, very nervous. I, I agree, it, you know, better if everybody is vaccinated, better if everybody is wearing a mask, even outside, um, but, you know, that's not going to be the case for everybody. So, and I think just another thing I would say is that, you know, I sometimes hear, well, like, you know, I'll be fine. Like, you know, I'm not worried about me. I'll, I'll be fine. Or I'll, you know, I'll deal with whatever happens. And, you know, this is one of those things where it's not just about you, you know, it's not just about me, the individual, the person it's, I affect what I do affects other people. And so, um, you know, again, it's that we are all in this together. And so, you know, even folks who are vaccinated, we are learning. And again, I agree this, um, you know, that things are changing very quickly. And even, you know, what things looked like last week is looks a little bit different this week. And I, I'll be honest, I'll say things that I was fairly comfortable with a week ago, I'm not comfortable with today, and it'll probably look different again next week. Um, and the science continues to evolve as we learn more. And, and that's good. It's, it's good that we are learning new things. Um, but based on what I have heard most recently, is that even people who are vaccinated could potentially, um, you know, be asymptomatic, not have any symptoms, but still have COVID and spread it to others you know, without even knowing it, you know, that's really, really concerning, especially when people under, you know, kids under 12 cannot get vaccinated right now. They do not have the opportunity to get vaccinated. And so, you know, I hear from parents a lot who say, you know, I feel like I'm, my kids are just being forgotten in all this because they are at risk. And I would love it if everybody would do all they could to help to protect my kids because my kids are at risk. The other thing I'll say, and I'm ranting a little bit, but I, it gets me fired up. So I'll just say one more thing is that, you know, I sometimes hear, well, you know, kids, we don't, we aren't seeing kids dying of this. So it's not a big deal. Yes, it's true that the, the, you know, the death rate for kids is lower, but it doesn't mean that it's not a big deal. Kids do get sick and we don't know the long-term effects of COVID on kids. Um, you know, there are kids that are COVID long haulers that, you know, and they have a lifetime ahead of them. And we certainly don't want our little ones to have, you know, the next 60, 70 years of health issues. It just doesn't have to be that way. So, so, you know, we all have to look out for uh, each other and the state fair makes me nervous. <laughs> all right. Another question that might require a look into the old crystal ball Will the legislature return to normal in-person hearings next session? Well, I think there's a desire to do that. There certainly is. And at the very end of the session that just ended, as we got a special session, I should say, uh, people were coming back to the floor. And it was, you know, it is very different. And it is... Um, much to be preferred for a lot of reasons, uh, not the least of which is that the public really doesn't have the kind of access that you all should have when we're doing everything virtual. So it's important. But now um, we've the speaker just issued a, another um, memo to staff saying, we, it's not time for you to come back and work on site. Our staff are still working remotely for the most part. And we're just going to have to play it by ear and see, um, because the legislature is going to need to meet. I mean, it is there. There are so many things that this epidemic has brought upon us, just needs that people have. And the legislature really has to be there to meet the needs. So this is not a situation where we can just say, you know, oh, we'll just only we'll stay home until March or stay home until April. We're probably going to end up, if I had to guess, um, working remotely at least some of the time. But I, I certainly hope it's not the case. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, we don't know, right? I think things are changing. Um, and, you know, if you'd asked me that two months ago, I would have said, yeah, I think probably, you know, we will be in person. It'll look much different. Today, I think we we don't know. I mean, we it depends on what what happens and how we move forward. And um, 
you know, this Delta variant is concerning and our numbers, as we've said, are going up. So I, I agree that certainly the desire is there and there is absolutely a benefit to being in person. Um, having just a little bit of a taste and experience of what that was like at that last week of the special session when most everybody was in the chamber. Um, definitely see the benefits of that, um, but we have to balance that with keeping people safe. I, I will also say, I hope that we keep some of the virtual capabilities, especially in terms of committee meetings, because I think it was really valuable to have that option and accessibility for people. Um, and I think it, it can be valuable moving forward. So in terms of you know, people coming to testify before a committee, you know, if people live four hours away, they're not having to drive, you know, make an eight hour round trip to testify in front of a committee for a few minutes. Um, I think, I, so I hope we keep some of those pieces because um, I think that was valuable, but I think, you know, we have to wait and see how it goes and see what happens. I will say I'm really thankful for Speaker Hortman. I know she absolutely um, has prioritized you know, all of our safety and which includes staff. I think that's something that we don't often think of. It's not just members who are, are you know, in spaces together. It's our staff too, who don't have a choice about, um, you know, being there or not being there necessarily. And so um, I appreciate Speaker Hortman's um, priority of, of making good decisions that have kept people safe. Okay, next question here comes from the chat on Zoom. What are some ideas for advocating for paid family medical leave during these next few months? Well, that is, um, uh, boy, I, I got to say, we have uh, the last few years in, in this session, um, DFLers have worked very, very hard to push forward that issue of paid family medical leave and a paid family leave and, and paid sick leave because it's almost like incredible that in Minnesota, a state like Minnesota, there are still people who can't stay home for a day because they have no paid sick leave. You know, that just seems like, how can that be? But, you know, the, the whole issue about paid family leave, I think it's, um, We've had many hearings on it. I think it probably went through, I don't know how many different committees. It's a, a, you know, a, a big change as a policy and the bill has been worked on, the policy's been worked on. I really believe that if we could get that passed, it would be about the best single thing we could do for Minnesotans. The best thing because the whole, and, and you know, when we think about the COVID, COVID pandemic and the sort of stress that people are under, if you can't take, if you can't stay home, your child is sick, you can't stay home to take care of your child, this kind of thing. And the sort of pressure it puts on the child, the parents, the whole family, this, this is a, a component of health. And I, I just think it, it would be the best thing ever if we could get to it. So we're going to keep fighting for that. Um, sometimes I think we've succeeded in doing some, making some headway with our Republican colleagues in the Senate, a little bit of headway. But um, there are people for whom they just will never, you know, that this isn't about explanation. This isn't about data. This isn't about rationality. It's, it's really you know, they're so against what they view as mandates or, uh, you know, new policies. They just don't want to go there. So there is an element of this. It probably will require, again, changing some of the decision makers to change the decision. But I, I just really look forward to the day when we could pass this in Minnesota, because I just think it would be such a tremendous thing for Minnesotans, so beneficial for our kids for our working families. I, I just, it, it just touches everything. So it's really hard to overstate how, how big of a deal this is. Yeah, I completely agree with all of that. I think it would be huge. I think it's something we absolutely need to do. I will continue to advocate and, and work towards it and work for it. In terms of what can 
people do to advocate. Um, I, I agree with Representative Liebling. I think it's it's the the, the reality of it is either uh, you know people need to be convinced you know their minds need to be changed so their votes are changed or there needs to be different people to cast those votes it has to be one or the other and so I would say you know what can you do is continue to have those conversations with the, the you know people who represent you both in the house and the senate um, you know if it's you know representative Liebing or I you know where we stand but I'm still happy to talk to you about it um, and you know it continue to to advocate and make it known to the people who represent you this is what you are calling for this is what you want um and you know if it, you know if we can't get there with the people who are you know in those seats now then we need different people in those seats perhaps to make those decisions all right we just got a few questions left from the ones that were submitted ahead of time so if you I have a topic you'd like either of the lawmakers to address. Be sure to drop the question in uh, in the chat on Zoom or on Facebook. Uh, next question here. What did the legislature do to fight the spread of chronic wasting disease? Um, so I know there were efforts. This is in the Environment Committee. And um, boy, they had a really tough negotiating year. Um, that is what I heard. This is the committee where the um, the senator who was the chief negotiator, I think, went off for several weeks of vacation in the middle. I forgot now where he went, but Alaska, just, I think it was. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. Alaska. And he just said, I'm just not going to negotiate. And he went to Alaska. Um, but eventually they were able to get a bill. This Remember, this was over the clean cars issue that there was like, we're not going to negotiate as long as Governor Walz has a clean cars rule. And that eventually went by the wayside and the clean cars rule went forward. But in terms of chronic wasting disease, you know, this is something I don't know how familiar people are, but we have a lot of deer in Southeast Minnesota. In fact, a lot of them are visiting my yard. I don't know about you, but I see them often. And we actually have a pretty serious problem with chronic wasting disease, which is a, a fatal disease of deer and elk. And um, it is uh, probably harmful to human health. We, we don't have a ton of data on it. It's a prion disease. So it's extremely hard to control. It may even persist in the soil. And the belief is that it is spread by farmed cervidae, so the deer, the elk farms, we used to have one just up on Highway 52. Um, so there was a really an attempt to kind of get the deer farmers and the elk farmers to, to do better and to do better in how we regulate them and deal with the whole topic. Because, I mean, this is a big deal. It's a big deal impacting not just the huge industry, the deer hunters. I mean, I'm not a deer hunter, but this is a big deal to a lot of folks. But also it's really a human health issue at the end of the day as well. But we weren't able to really do much at all. I think we maybe had a slight change in who is going to regulate the, the deer and the elk. But the attempts to um, you know, put more structure around the farmers who are raising these animals. And, you know, because very often the, the, the belief is that it spreads when the animals are raised close together, because in nature, of course, they're much more spread out. It's, gee, it kind of sounds like, like COVID a little bit, right? If you're spread out, you're not going to be spreading it as much. So the deer are together, they're spreading it and in the farmed situation. And then if they escape, they get out and it spreads very easily to the wild herd. So a lot of folks, the deer hunters are very concerned about it, but also, you know, as I say, for a health issue and even here in the city, I mean, this is really important. So um, it's one of those things, you know, where regulation is a bad word. And, uh, you know, it's another one of these issues where you know, it's great for people to have their business. And, you know, I'm not saying we shouldn't have those businesses, but they need to be regulated in a way that protects everybody's health and then protects the wider deer hunting industry. So that's one we're going to have to go back and keep working on. 
All right, uh, next question here, uh, HR 2825S2001, this is called the Prime <clears throat> Act, which supports local food production and small businesses while also reducing vehicle miles traveled with livestock trailers and helping to meet the consumer demand for locally raised meat. I'd like you to support this bill. It sounds like it might be more of a you know, federal topic here, but either of you have anything to, to add on this? So this is um, um, when when I see the letters HR right away in in Minnesota our bills are HF House file or Senate file SF. So when I see HR, it tells me usually that it's a, a federal congressional bill or perhaps another state. They different states use different titles, and you know I appreciate that uh, this was submitted because. Um, it's often very difficult to know what level of government deals with what. And even as a legislator, I get confused sometimes too. Oh, do we have control over that? Why, you know, or who does? And, and sometimes, um, you know, the officials at different levels, the state, the city, the cities, the counties, and the federal officials kind of sometimes sort of hand questions back and forth between each other because it's often hard to figure out exactly who has jurisdiction. So this one appears to be a federal issue, which means that off the bat, I, I frankly didn't know anything about it. And what I would say is, I don't know who asked the question, but I would just invite you to, um, first of all, you know, email us and just educate us about it. So we're, we're always interested in what you're interested in and what kinds of things you want to see happen. But the, the bill itself is kind of not in our bailiwick, but what we'll often do, what I, what I really like to do is invite people to ask me the question if they don't know who to ask, because I'm happy to direct you. And if I don't know, I have wonderful, excellent staff who can help find out um, who should, who's, uh, you know, whose table this one is on. So, you know, please do contact us offline. I'd hate to say whether I support something or don't when I really don't know much about it, but happy to, happy to learn, always happy to learn and um, happy to have you ask, um, even if, even if it turns out you're asking the wrong level of government, because it's, it's just impossible to know unless you ask often. All right, I think that brings us to what will be our final question then. Um, so the Census Bureau must still release data for redistricting. How will this be done in a fair, open, and transparent process? Representative Bolden, why don't you take that one? I can take that. So um, yes, we will be getting more information soon. Um, in August, more data will be, more census data will come out to us. And so the, the process for that uh, here in Minnesota, it looks different in different states, but here in Minnesota, we do um, have a committee for that. I, I, neither of us sit on that committee, but um, they will get that information and um, uh, look to make recommendations for that. Again, because we are in a, a divided legislature, only one in the country, and by that, um, by that I mean that there's a Democrat a majority in the House and a Republican majority in the Senate. Um, and again, both, uh, you know, there needs to be agreement. Um, it is uh, a challenge. It, it will be a challenge um, to come to an agreement um, on that. And in fact, for the last, I want to say 50 years or 50 times, you know, this has happened, we, our legislature has not been able to come to an agreement because of that. Um, and if there's not an agreement that is, you know, able to be struck, then it goes to the courts. Um, and so that, that will be the process. Well, it's, it's in process now and, and we'll have to see kind of how that goes and, um, the, the maps have to be finalized by, I believe, February 15th. Um, so we'll know for sure then, but that will sort of be the, the process until then. Um, the last thing I um, will say, and then we'll see if um, Rep. Liebling wants to add anything, is just that, you know, I think it's, it's important that we 
have fair maps. And the bottom line is it's important that we have fair maps. We want to be sure that we are doing this in a fair way um, because that voters should choose their electeds, not the other way around. And so we want to be sure that there's a fair process um, for that. And so that's kind of- what Yeah, we'll thanks. thanks, Liz. And you know, one thing that I would add to that is that in Minnesota, um, you know, we don't see the kind of gerrymandering. Sometimes I get questions about gerrymandering, right? You see in some states, these tremendously weird district shapes. And we haven't really had that in Minnesota. Now, there are some things about the way our districts have been drawn that you can argue with, you always can. But we haven't had this kind of blatant gerrymandering. And I think that part of that is because we we do often have a divided legislature or we have a um, we have a, a governor who's of opposite party or something like that. And oftentimes our map making does go to the courts and they do this in a, a nonpartisan manner. And they do take, I think they take testimony. So I think you will see the house probably produce a map and I, I was told by the chair of the committee that she gets along very well with the lead Republican on her committee and that she expects to produce a good nonpartisan or bipartisan map that will then do, you know, can be a guide for the court that ultimately will decide it. And it's really, in a way, it's too bad that it has to happen that way because, um, you know, the legislature is supposed to do it and it would be done just like any other bill. So the House would produce one, the Senate would produce one, there would be a negotiation, an agreement, and then it would go to the governor to be signed. And it's never happened that way. Um, and it, it would be preferable, I think, because it would allow for more input from citizens because, but, you know, it is what it is. And um, so, I must say the one thing about that specifically is that I really am hoping that in our area that we will have a Senate district. Right now, as you know, the city is kind of divided in half into two Senate districts. And each of those Senate districts has a chunk of Rochester and then a whole lot of rural area and townships and things like that. So what that means is that Rochester City really doesn't get its interests hurt because it doesn't have anybody whose interests are not divided. And as Rochester is growing and has more of the kinds of issues that other big cities have, I believe that it really needs representation, you know, that is, that is not divided. Now, most of the time it doesn't matter. You know, there are a lot of issues that are not city, they're not urban rural issues. They're not township city divided issues, but the ones that are, it just becomes extremely difficult when, when we have nobody in the Senate that's just for Rochester. So I hope that the courts, are, you know, I hope that this time we might get there. Um, didn't work last time, but, you know, we'll see. We are growing as a city. And so it's going to be very interesting to see what changes happen. Um, one other thing I do want to say about it is that you all probably know that because of COVID, the census data was delayed. And this is really, um, it's really problematic. Everything's getting pushed back because of this. And, um, you know, the political process is going to kind of have to start before people know what the districts are. And that's always, you know, just to keep life interesting. Right. So, you know, people will have to decide to run without knowing, you know, fully or start the process without fully knowing what district will be available to them. So. All right, well, we've uh, reached the end of our questions. So uh, Representative Liebling, uh, you maybe want to go first on offering any closing comments you might have and then followed by Representative Bolden. Well, sure. Well, once again, thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. It's really, um, you know, it would be really more fun to sit in a room and have more of an exchange. And I hope we're going to do that. And um, as Representative Bolden mentioned, we, we have a couple of 
in-person town halls planned on different topics, and you'll hear more about those later. We, we hope we'll be able to do them. I, I am a little nervous about the COVID situation, but, um, you know, we certainly will. We certainly are going to try because we, we would really like to be able to, to have more interpersonal uh, talking with everybody. But, you know, just want to tell you that I, first of all, I am so appreciative of uh, the privilege of being able to serve you in the Minnesota House. And it's, it's really an awesome privilege. And so thank you so very much for that. And thank you for interacting with us. And I just wanna remind you that even though, you know, we might be remote, whatever, um, we both of us live in Rochester. We're here, we're available to you. You can send us an email. We can, the other day I met in somebody's home. Can't say I wasn't a little nervous about the COVID, but you know, we did it. Um, you know, we can get together, we can meet you for coffee, we can, you know, try to help you in whatever way uh, you might want to seek our assistance. So um, here for you and uh, just thank you again for joining us this evening. And also thank you to DJ for helping us in running this town hall. Yeah, I would echo that. Thanks to everybody for joining and submitting really thoughtful questions. Um, thanks also to DJ for uh, helping us and thank I would just also extend a thanks to uh, Representative Liebling who has been an amazing partner uh, over this last year and first session as I have had you know a million and one questions and I'm learning every day. Uh, she's been very helpful and gracious and kind and I'm really appreciative for that and I'm, I'm grateful to be able to call on her expertise. Um, and I, I would also just, again, say it is just such an honor and a privilege, um, and I, I just feel such a responsibility to represent our community, and so thank you um, for entrusting me with that. I work for you, and so I want to hear from you. I want to hear what is important to you. You know, having um, conversations with constituents is just one of the very, very best parts of this work, and so um, it, it really, really matters, and it's really important to me what is important to you, and so I want to hear that, and so would echo that. Please reach out if you want to have a conversation, um, if you have a question, if you want to know how I feel about a topic, or if I can help you with anything, if you're navigating, um, you know, um, issues with the rental help or, or other things with the state, um, happy to help with that and do what I can. So please reach out, whether that's via email. So all of our um, emails are uh, rep.firstname.lastname at house.mn. So um, please reach out that way. Otherwise, I'm always available on uh, social media as well, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of those pieces too. So would love to hear from you and thank you again for being here tonight. I hope to stay connected. And stay tuned for more information on other sort of things we have coming up for us. Thanks, everybody. Good night. <laughs>